Hello and welcome to this lecture. Today we are going to discuss cystosomiasis and I'm going to present one of the case uh, study that I found very interesting regarding this topic. And the case study is discussing about uh, the outbreak of urogenital cystosomiasis in Corsica, France and epidemiology study. The article is quite lengthy but I'm going to summarize in few minutes. The main thing is that they identify the spread of cystosomiasis uh, through fresh water, uh, swimming pools, uh, from the tourists that come from uh, Senegal in Africa, they travel to France and from fresh water pool, uh, they spread this disease. And they are talking about uh, the detail about the summer of 2013, where more than 120 uh, local people are tourists infected from that uh, cystosomiasis and they identify that around 3,500, 3,544, uh, 3,544 snails, uh, they recover from the site and they found the presence of the causative organism cystosomas uh, present inside the snails where it, this, uh, these snails are the site for, uh, for their growth and production for their hybrid, hybridization hybridization between two species of the causative organisms and then uh, they explaining these all contexts you can read this case study it is very interesting so the cystosomiasis infects around uh, 230 million persons it is also a life-threatening disease that can kill um, many people and we mentioned that more than 200,000 individuals infected uh, kill annually. Causative organisms are so many, but I mentioned the main one like Cystosoma mansoni or S. japonicum. The site is, uh, could be the liver and gut that where it can uh, uh, prominently stay and then it can spread. Uh, S. mansoni is actually more uh, uh, limited to or grow to in Latin America and Africa or S. japonicum in East Asia or S. hematobium in Southern Africa. Actually in this article they are also talking about S. hematobium that uh, spread. So they are different species. They are and they are actually reside in different uh, countries. And when we discuss the pathogenesis, uh, the main thing is that it caused the inflammatory reactions uh, by the host inflammatory reactions at different stages of parasites. There is a life cycle for cystosomiasis. As if we see our, uh, the article that I discussed with, with you that it spread in the swimming pool, freshwater swimming pool. So if our uh, infected person enter in the swimming pool, like tourists, there are so many tourists from different parts of the world. And if they enter in the swimming pool, they may have, they may are the carrier and uh, maybe they, if they enter the swimming pool and then through swimming pool, uh, in, in the water, it can be spread through feces or through urine. So this cycle, if you take a look, so, so this is an infected person. If uh, he or she urinate in the swimming pool, the urine, they contain different causative organisms, like I mentioned, S. japonicum, S. mensonae, or hematobium. Then they, they release myricardia. This word will be commonly, you know, you will get to know with cystosomiasis. So the egg, will release the myricardia. The myricardia will reside in the snails. And in this, uh, that review article, or that systematic uh, article, uh, in that review article, we discuss about the snails in Corticica. So the, the snails are the site where it can reside, where it can reside. Then uh, the sporocytes uh, will grow Maybe if, for example, two organisms or two causative organisms, S. mensonae or S. japonicum, uh, reside in the, in the snail, maybe it can make a new uh, hybrid. So it may potentiate further disease or maybe more deadly uh, causative organism. Then, obviously, if a person have any bruises in the skin or in around any uh, body feeds, it can enter into the body, penetrate inside the body, and they have a tail. That tail is very important because this tail, uh, they can move, they are motile, they enter into the body, they can affect uh, the mention I mentioned in, is 
uh, the liver and the gut if they reach in the liver and gut so then it can affect through hepatic portal vein then when it goes inside uh, the tail will be lost after certain time it can reach into the circulation migrate through portal blood uh, in the liver i already mentioned and then it migrate uh, to mesenteric venules of bowel rectum and ling egg and that egg then again uh, sheds through uh, bladder uh, or through urine or through feces so there's a complete cycle that is going on in cystosomiasis so what they are doing the main thing is that the t cells of the cd4 receptors recognize the pathogen and they find they form the bond uh, like the antigen presenting cells they form the bond with cd4 cells like with t receptor cells and they making the complex bonding uh, and then uh, they are responsible for uh, further differentiation of th1 cells that activate macrophages and cytotoxic t cells or th2 cells that activate beta cells or th17 cells that is responsible for recruitment of neutrophils and macrophages so the inflammate the immune response work like that and this picture is talking about on the left side is the immune suppressed condition and on the right side is the normal condition so in the immune suppressed condition there will be the reduction of the number of uh, uh, inflammatory mediators and they are explaining in terms of uh, different mediators that will be appearing if you take a look of this histological slide this arrow is showing you is actually the presence of dense fibrosis which is a key indicator having scattered granuloma and when you take a look on the right side this white arrow they are showing you this white arrow is showing you the presence of uh, the uh, mericardium containing egg so you can see the two main characteristics the form presence of mericardium containing egg on the right side and on the left side there will be the fibrosis along with we know that there will be prominent eosinophils uh, histocytes and the giant cells will be also observed uh, this is a macroscopic investigation where we found the pipe stem uh, fibrosis you can see these pipe stem fibrosis will be found and is because of the cystosoma japona japonicum infection and this is another picture to explain how it can spread through feces or through urine and the egg lay down it hatch into the snails the snails will be the site for maybe to make more uh, dangerous uh, hybrid cystosomes they enter into the body through feet or through any injured part uh, then it can reach into the circulation through uh, hepatic portal vein through liver and it can cause pipe stem like porous uh, cirrhosis and then spread to other body parts and then it can produce more egg and then it can release the egg uh, and again discharge where the person is residing they also mentioned the presence of ovum with granuloma and this is another ovum the, along with the presence of neutrophils and eosinophils so the inflammatory action obviously it will be occur in that conditions then urinary cystosomiasis uh, it is caused with the infection with cystosoma hematobium lead to this disease and uh, the, in the acute phase of this infection it is called as uh, sarcarial penetration what is the meaning of sarcarial this is actually different uh, stages of uh, the uh, cystosomes like the egg stage then we have the mericardium stage then it can develop into sporocyte and this is sarcarium that having the teeth so this is a life cycle of uh, this disease and if you take a look of this cycle that how the x can pass through urine and if you take a look that f if the egg pass through urine it can hatch and release mericardia the mericardia then enter into the snail it can undergo the cycle it can then go inside through your wound through your open wound through your legs or through your body and then it after getting inside inside your body it can spread through hepatic portal vein and when when it enter into the hepatic portal vein it can migrate into heart it can migrate into other body organs and it can grow as long as 11 mm and uh, so how how much dangerous this disease is is that
I have one video for this topic and I will share it with you as well. So if it if it stays inside the bladder, uh, it can form schistomycels, papillomas, and tubercles. It can make uh, nodular carcinoma and the end stage cystosomal bladder consists of fibrosis calcification of the bladder and numerous papillomas and nodules will be formed so this is the disease that we are going to discuss i will share with you one video regarding that so thank you so much for today's lecture hope to see you again based on the work of two research teams one led by dr owen standen at the welcome laboratories of tropical medicine in the early 50s and the other led by Dr. Diane McLaren in the late 80s at the National Institute for Medical Research. Dr. McLaren's scanning and transmission electron micrographs of the schistosome are featured in our video. This is the image seen in the microscope which is enlarged still further when processed photographically. It should be appreciated that these electron micrographs represent a wide range of magnifications. For example, this adult male schistosome is magnified about 35 times when viewed on a 50 centimeter television screen. His ventral sucker, 500 times. And this spiny inside edge of the sucker, 7,000 times. Some of our images are magnified around a quarter of a million times, like this section showing the outer surface of a larval schistosome. It was with the aid of this electron microscope that Dr. McLaren was able to unravel one of the most puzzling stages in the life cycle of the schistosome. The crucial process is involved in the transformation from free living organism to a parasitic way of life. These happy children are playing in water that is more than likely to be infected by one of the world's most damaging parasitic diseases. Schistosomes are parasitic flukes that live in the bloodstream of man. They cause the disease schistosomiasis, probably better known as bilharzia, a major health problem for hundreds of millions of people in many tropical and subtropical regions of the world. A male schistosome is seen here with a female partly held in his gynecophoric canal. The male is about a centimetre long and uses the lateral folds of his body to form the gynecophoric canal with which he embraces the longer, more slender female. Incidentally, the scientific name schistosoma means cleft-bodied. This is the anterior part of the cleft which surrounds the head end of the female. Here are the paired schistosomes in the portal vein of an experimentally infected hamster. The flukes migrate as far as they can into the mesenteric veins and the female extends out of the gynecophoric canal to deposit her eggs into the smaller blood vessels. The eggs then work through the tissues into the lumen of the intestine. In this species of schistosome, the eggs pass out later with the feces. Here's an egg in a fecal smear. The earliest records of urinary schistosomiasis are to be found in the Ebers papyrus, dated around 1900 BC. Although the ancient Egyptians did not know the cause of the disease, they recognized and clearly illustrated the urinary symptoms in their hieroglyphics. Calcified schistosome eggs have also been identified in the kidneys of mummies more than 3,000 years old. It was not until 1851 that the German pathologist Theodor Bilharz identified schistosoma hematobium as the causative agent of urinary schistosomiasis in Egypt. In 1904, Katsurada described the life cycle of Japonicum. And in 1907, Sambon described Mansoni as a separate species. In 1934, Fischer recorded the existence of intercalatum, and as recently as 1978, Vogue, Bruckner and Bruce discovered Mekongai. Today, 18 species are recognized. Of these, Mansoni, Japonicum and Hematobium probably infect more people worldwide than any of the other species. Mansoni lives chiefly in the veins of the large intestine. 
and this part of the portal circulation is also infected by a japonicum. The passage of eggs through the intestinal tissues causes ulceration, thickening and fibrosis of the bowel wall. Eggs can be seen in this much thickened region of the superficial layers of the intestine. Also at the bases of the villi. Those eggs which enter the lumen of the gut are discharged with the faeces. Schistosoma haematobium differs from the other two species. It inhabits the blood vessels of the bladder and its eggs are discharged with the urine. The main clinical sign is hematuria, but ultimately fibrotic lesions may develop throughout the whole of the urogenital system. Bladder cancer is not an uncommon development in advanced stages of the disease. Schistosomiasis is currently endemic in 75 countries. Hematobium is present in 53 countries, mostly in Africa, but also in the eastern Mediterranean. Mansoni shows a similar distribution, except that it's also found in South America, notably Brazil, where it was probably carried with the slave trade. Japonicum, on the other hand, is confined to countries of the Far East, China, Indonesia and the Philippines. Japan, where the parasite was originally found, has now been freed from the disease. Mekongai occurs in Southeast Asia. And intercalatum is found in Central and West Africa. Worldwide, some 200 million people are infected with the schistosomes and 500 to 600 million are at risk. The highest infection rates are found in Brazil, Egypt and the Sudan. Freshwater snails play an essential role in the transmission of the disease, since each schistosome will spend part of its life cycle in the tissues of a snail. Species of Bulinus are intermediate hosts for haematobium. Biomphalaria carries mansoni, and Oncomelania carries japonicum. Wholesale destruction of the snail hosts with chemical molluscicides is one obvious method of reducing the incidence of schistosomiasis. But since the snails are hermaphrodite, possessing both male and female sexual organs, it needs only one individual to survive a control program of this kind for an entire area to be repopulated within a single season. Moreover, development projects such as hydroelectric schemes like the gigantic Kariba Dam on the Zambezi have created large bodies of water and consequently enabled the snails to flourish in recent years. Although most infected people carry only small numbers of schistosomes, treatment with an effective drug not only reduces the prevalence of the disease, it also reduces morbidity. Praziquantel is currently the drug of choice, since a single dose affects all the main species of schistosome that infect man, and it produces high cure rates. Oxamniquin is also used for mansoni, especially in South America, while metrifonate is valuable for the treatment of haematobium. It's man's primitive habits with regard to urination and defecation which maintain the disease in the community. Obviously, the separation of urine and faeces from waters inhabited by the snails is vital in the control of infection. In the third world, this is easier said than done. However, in Zimbabwe, the Blair Research Laboratories have produced some interesting designs for simple water pumps and lavatories. This one is a strong shelter built over a deep pit. It has an odour pipe, fly traps and is easy to keep clean. And here are some variations on the basic design. The Blair water pumps are ingenious. This one uses the pipe that delivers the water as the pump handle. In the playground of a village school, these girls are enjoying their swing pump. Official notices, pamphlets and posters are also used in an attempt to increase local awareness in endemic areas. The most desirable control measure would undoubtedly be a one-shot vaccine, and it's towards this goal that current research is mainly directed. 
All species of human schistosomes have essentially the same life cycle. We've chosen Mansoni for discussion here, as it's the easiest to maintain and investigate under laboratory conditions. The flukes live paired in the hepatic portal and mesenteric veins. The male is light in colour, with a dark central line, the gut, just visible. The female, partly held in his gynecophoric canal, appears very dark in comparison, because her gut is more obvious. The dark colour is haematin, a product of haemoglobin digestion, derived from red cells of the host's blood, which fills the double zigzag line of the gut. If you look closely, you'll see individual blood cells moving through the narrower passages. This female has an egg in her uterus. Above the egg is the spiralled vitiline duct. The female is cylindrical and has a relatively smooth surface. But the dorsal surface of the male bears many spiny bosses or tubercles that are thought to anchor him in position by catching against the walls of the blood vessels. There are numerous pits between the tubercles which presumably serve to increase the absorptive surface area, while sensory organelles are abundantly distributed over the entire body. These ensure that the schistosome is aware of minute changes in its microenvironment. Each fluke has two suckers at the anterior end of its body. The ventral sucker is used by the fluke to attach itself to the walls of the blood vessels. The very spiny surface of the sucker ensures a firm grip. The oral sucker is important for feeding and is used to ingest the red blood cells of the host. The orifice is spiny and its outer margin is well endowed with sense organs. In this electron micrograph we can see two blood cells inside the oral sucker. Here the well anchored pair seem to be traversed by continuous peristaltic waves which are probably associated with the rate of blood flow. Female schistosomes produce many hundreds of eggs a day, and these are deposited into a venule of the intestinal wall, where they become tightly lodged. The egg shell is covered with hundreds of needle-like spines, which abrade the tissue and enable the eggs to work their way across the bowel wall and through the villi. Here are two eggs in tissue at the bases of the intestinal villi. They're making their way towards and into the lumen of the gut. Later, they'll pass out of the body with the feces. Some eggs are inevitably swept back, past the flukes, and carried in the portal blood to the liver, where they eventually provoke an immune reaction and become encapsulated in a granuloma. These granulomas are clearly visible as white spots on the liver of an infected mouse. An egg is at the centre of this mass of infiltrating leukocytes, mainly mononuclear cells and eosinophils. These cells ultimately destroy many eggs. They've already started to invade the shell of this one. In severe chronic infections, the liver becomes filled with granulomas, and this leads to portal obstruction, hypertension, ascites, and massive enlargement of the liver and spleen. Compare the size of the organs in a normal mouse and a mouse harboring a chronic schistosome infection. These features of pathology accurately mimic the clinical symptoms of the human disease. Schistosome eggs are easily detected in faecal smears. They're about a seventh of a millimetre long and are comparatively large as Helminth eggs go. The prominent lateral spine is the characteristic feature of Schistosoma mansoni. The spine is terminal in Haematobium. And although lateral in Japonicum, the spine is very small. The Japonicum egg is much rounder and is therefore easily distinguished from the oval-shaped egg of Mansoni. 
When passed in the faeces, each egg contains a fully formed myricidium, whose surface is covered with hundreds of cilia. The myricidium also possesses two pairs of flame cells, which can be recognized by their flickering movement. They form part of the simple excretory system, and their activity shows that the organism is alive. In fresh water, the egg expands by osmosis, and as its contents become diluted, the myricidium is stimulated into activity. The movements of its surface cilia set up currents in the liquid, which appears to bubble. Suddenly, the shell is fractured, and the myricidium half emerges together with fluid from the egg. But the myricidium is still contained within the vitiline membrane, which surrounded it in the egg, and it has to struggle hard for a time before it finally manages to free itself. Then, in a moment, it's on its way in search of a particular species of snail. The myricidia are propelled by vibrating the thousands of minute hair-like cilia covering their elongated bodies. This is a critical period for them. They must find their particular species of snail within a few hours, or they'll die. The snail shown here is Biomphalaria glabrata from South America. The myricidia adhere to its exposed surfaces. They burrow their way in by a combination of enzymic digestion and mechanical movement. It takes about an hour for a myricidium to penetrate completely. Once this is accomplished, the myricidium transforms to a primary sporocyst, which migrates towards the liver of the snail and begins a process of asexual multiplication. In this way, many secondary or daughter sporocysts develop independently and grow into long, thin bodies that eventually become convoluted. They give rise to cercarii that bud off in continuous sequence. Finally, the liver tissue of the snail is almost completely replaced by sporocysts and free cercarii. This is a secondary sporocyst which has been dissected out of the liver of an infected snail. It contains mature cercarii which are struggling to get out. They have developed in the sporocyst with their tails folded back along their bodies. This one is struggling very vigorously to free itself. Remember, we are watching cercarii with space around them. If they were still inside the snail, they would be tightly packed and their movements greatly restricted. At about four weeks after infection, the first cercarii emerge from the snail and they're soon escaping daily in swarms. They're about half a millimeter long and are actively swimming organisms that travel through the water with characteristic movements, usually tail first. Their life is short, about 48 hours at most, for they have no functional gut and their rapidly expended energy reserves cannot be replaced. The cercaria has an elongated body region and a long forked tail. It also has an oral and a ventral sucker by which it adheres to any substrate. The external surface of the cercaria is covered with spines that are backwardly directed. These help it to penetrate the skin of its next host, since they ensure that the organism can only travel in a forward direction. Each cercaria has a secretory complex comprising three types of unicellular glands, which open through the oral sucker. This electron micrograph shows the folded gland openings. The glands contain powerful proteolytic enzymes which help the cercaria to digest its way through the skin of the host.
Here, cercarii are penetrating the tail skin of a mouse. They attach with their suckers, digest, and wriggle their way through the skin. Once the body is inside, the tail drops off but remains active. The parasite, now called the schistosomulum, is safely within its new host. The sequence is now repeated in diagram. A saccharia attaches and makes a hole in the epidermis. It deepens the aperture and enters it by elongating its body. Shedding its tail, it migrates through the dermis and fat layer where it turns, seeking a blood vessel. On finding one, it enters and starts its journey round the body of the host. It's carried in the bloodstream, first to the lungs. By this time, it's become longer and considerably more slender and lost its mid-body spines, although spines are retained at both ends. The spines, together with rhythmic activity, enable it to migrate along the tiny lung capillaries, which are often smaller in diameter than the larva itself. The flukes leave the lungs through the pulmonary veins and pass via the left side of the heart to the liver. The earliest migrants arrive in the liver six to eight days after infection. They become short and squat, begin to feed, and their intestines fill with dark hematin pigment. Two to three week old juvenile flukes are now more recognizable as schistosomes, but they have a convoluted system of folds and ridges on the surface. By week four, however, these folds are less conspicuous and dome-shaped elevations appear on the dorsal surface of males. They clearly represent early stages in the development of surface tubercles. Male and female flukes pair at around week five, and the male tubercles take on their characteristic spiny appearance. The paired flukes migrate through the portal vein to the mesenteric veins, and egg-laying begins. That completes the life cycle of the schistosome. We now have some observations on one of the most intriguing features of the life cycle, the transition from free-swimming cercaria to parasitic schistosomulum. The cercaria has to adapt very rapidly to its move from fresh water to body fluid, a temperature change of about 20 degrees, and a hostile environment. The most dramatic changes take place at the outer surface of the cercaria. This is a diagrammatic section through a cercaria. The surface is spiny and totally covered by a typical three-layered membrane. The outer layer is the glycocalyx. This is an electron micrograph of the three-layered membrane. Under the membrane is the tegument, a syncytium with no cell walls. Its nuclei are located in deeper cell bodies joined to the tegument by narrow, twisted connections. These are layers of muscle cells. This is how the section appears under the electron microscope. When the cercaria enters the tissues of its new host, large numbers of membranous secretion granules are synthesized in the subtegumental cells and pass up into the tegument. The bodies join together and then connect with the surface of the larva to liberate their membranes to the exterior. The original trilaminate membrane and the glycocalyx are cast off in a mass of microvilli. This action not only serves to distract the host's immune system, it also sensitizes the host against subsequent schistosome infection. The parasite rapidly covers itself with a new seven-layered membrane derived from the membranous bodies. 
The larva further confuses the host by disguising its surface with proteins derived from the host's red blood cells. At an early stage of infection, it's also thought that the host produces a class of antibodies which attach to the invading parasites. Their function is rather puzzling in that they're not aggressive towards the parasite. Furthermore, they serve to block the killing of the parasite by other toxic antibodies. Later, there's a switch so that the toxic antibodies predominate. This could explain the finding that young children playing in infected water have no resistance to schistosomiasis and may become heavily infected. But as they get older, they develop an effective immune response that kills newly invading parasites and thus limits the number of schistosomes they carry. Because man eventually develops this partial immunity, Concerted efforts are being made in many research laboratories to analyse the mechanisms responsible for killing the flukes and to characterise the parasite antigens against which the host's responses are directed. Present research gives hope that it will be possible to design and produce a vaccine for human use. It would be an acceptable and desirable first step in disease control if the vaccine could reduce the debilitating pathology caused by schistosome eggs. Schistosomes, like many other parasites, have a variety of ways of avoiding the lethal effects of immunity. Shedding of microvilli, using host protein as a disguise, and the development of blocking antibodies. These are but three of their many tricks. A really successful vaccine will have to be several jumps ahead of these highly sophisticated evasive strategies. Until that time comes, we must rely on improved standards of hygiene to break the life cycle of the parasite and drugs to reduce the infection. But the problems of expense, the need for repeated drug administration, and the ever-present threat of drug resistance mean that researchers are working against the clock to develop an effective vaccination programme.